Welcome to The Chattery with Jazz O'Brien. Jazz will take you on a journey through a wide variety of topics. Be ready to enjoy her passion for insight and knowledge. Please welcome your host, Jazz O'Brien. The podcast is starting in 3, 2, 1. Hi, I'm Jazz O'Brien and welcome to The Chattery, the definitive compendium of conversation, insight and intrigue since 2022. The show that has a list of topics more diverse than my career aspirations. Everything about everything, or at least that's the goal. To coin the phrase, the chattery is genre fluid. If you'd like to subscribe to the chattery and help keep us ad free, then please head on over to patreon.com forward slash the chattery and never miss a single thing. Membership benefits include everything from birthday shout outs to newsletters to being able to get your hands on some chattery merch. In a changed format, all contact details will be at the end of this episode. So, a big shout out to all listeners, both in the UK and abroad. And wherever you're listening from, I hope that life is treating you very kindly indeed and that you're all ready for a brand new episode. So, what's today's episode all about then? If I say to you, deck of cards, what will come to mind? Well, in most cases, it'll be a cardboard box containing 52 pieces of card with either black or red colouring and which can be divided into four suits. Hearts, diamonds, spades and clubs. Most pubs, bars, hotels and in fact anywhere where people gather to socialise and relax will have a deck and most households will have at least one pack knocking about somewhere whether that's in the back of a kitchen drawer, in the kids' toy box, sat alongside your Jenga Connect 4 or jigsaws, or on your bookshelf, spare bedroom windowsill, or in your sock drawer. They are used for everything from passing the time on a long journey to playing snap with young children, learning the odd card trick, Christmas fun and games, and of course, gambling. Playing cards are everywhere and one of the most recognisable items in the world. The number of decks sold worldwide on an annual basis is mind-boggling. According to the stats, 27 million decks are sold every single year, within Europe and America alone. Data Intello, a market research company, estimated that between 2016 and 2030, The card market is expected to increase by 2.5%. Not bad, eh, for a game that has been around for well over a thousand years. But wait, have you ever wondered about the history of the handball playing cards? Well, you know I love looking into and bringing you those subjects you never knew you needed to know. So, I promise you that after listening to this episode you'll never look at that deck of cards in quite the same way ever again. Because guess what? You'll not believe half the stuff that's coming our way in this episode. Stuff that will baffle, intrigue, and frankly, make you wonder how on earth you never noticed the details all this time. All contained within that pack of playing cards that's been hiding in plain sight your whole life. So... Strap on those seatbelts and let's get our foot down and hit that accelerator. Because this is one I'm excited to crack on with. And one where I found an unexpected yet tantalising fact around each and every corner. We'll start by looking at the mysterious history of the cards. Then go on to look at their uses and place within society. And then on to what cards mean and how they fit into society today. It all sounds very neat and tidy, doesn't it? Well, it's not. It's a hotbed of mess and loose ends. So here we go then, the mysterious history of the cards. This area is so controversial that even the origins of the playing card are fiercely debated. Can you believe? There's a wealth of literature and speculation out there on this very point. However, Owing to the fact that we have very little written at the time of the invention of playing cards, there is a lot, and I mean a lot of speculation out there. So, we try in this episode to shimmy our way through facts mainly, 
and you can make your own mind up on the rest. Depending on who you ask then and where in the world you are, it's largely agreed that cards originate from 9th century China and somewhere around 850 AD. For those of you like me, took your first year of high school, art teacher's instruction as word, you'll probably be labouring under the misapprehension that Johannes Gutenberg invented the first printing press. Wrong. A closer look actually reveals that he was the first to introduce the first movable printing press to Europe. You know, one thing I'm becoming more conscious of the older I get is that behind any innovation, there's always a back backstory. As it happens, it turns out we should be giving credit to the Chinese and Koreans for Gutenberg's inspiration and back backstory, for it was they who were the original innovators and know-how behind the printing press. Evidence often cited for this fact is that the oldest known surviving printed text originates from Dunhuang in China. It is the Diamond Sutra, a Buddhist book dated around 868 AD during the Tang dynasty. Other texts have survived from the same period and Dunhuang, such as mathematical charts, funeral and wedding etiquette guides, as well as children's educational material and dictionaries. Some playing card historians, and yes, there is such a person as a playing card historian, claim that playing cards originate from a Chinese game which translates as leaves. Printers would stick several pieces of paper together and cut them into smaller playing card sized pieces and draw pictures on them. Dominoes and mahjong are other games originating from China and closely resemble the cards. So, probably spin-offs then. Some, however, believe that cards were invented in Persia, which these days is Iran, and spread east towards China, India and Asia, west to Egypt and ultimately down through Europe. Whatever the truth, whether it be China or Persia, what the experts all agree on is that the East is where it all started. Mameluk is an Arabic word and translates as one who is owned. The Mameluk were originally slaves who were taken by the Arabs from their native Turkey and were then trained as soldiers in Egypt. The Mameluk were known as warrior soldiers and eventually became a knightly military class of their own, all the while closely controlled by their Arab owners. These warrior soldiers famously fought European Christian crusaders who had travelled to the Holy Lands and the Mamelukes successfully expelled them from the east on several occasions, but most notably in 1169 and 1231. Side note, for anyone unfamiliar, the Crusades were a series of holy wars where Western churches directed soldiers to clear the Holy Lands, so for example Jerusalem and its surrounding areas, of Islamic rule. A hundred years ago, one of my A-levels was medieval history, and I often therefore get carried away when looking into the Crusades. So I'm forcing myself to stop right here on this point, right now, full stop, thank you very much. The Mamelukes were seen as superior, if you like, to an ordinary slave, as ordinary slaves performed mainly menial household tasks and were not permitted to carry weapons or tools, which the Mameluk were. They were essentially enslaved mercenaries and eventually, when they were freed, became traders from the east and eventually traded their way down to southern Europe. The old silk route would have been filled with Mameluk traders. The Topkapi Palace in Istanbul today houses an ancient and the only known set of Mameluk playing cards, which have been dated to the 15th century. Actually, we came across the Topkapi Museum in the Chatteris' very first episode in March when we looked at another well-travelled guy, Piri Rice, for those of you who haven't listened to any previous episodes and are interested in history and its mysteries. You may want to tune into episode one. Anyway, getting back to the point, although some of the cards are missing, the Mameluk cards resemble European ones, in that they are divided into four suits. The Mameluk suits were polo sticks, coins, swords and myriads, which are basically cups or goblets. 
These symbols represented the pastimes of Mameluke aristocracy. So, for example, polo sticks, which later became clubs in the European decks that we're all familiar with today. The other Mameluke suits of swords, coins and cups are the same as those still used in Italy and Spain today and therefore adds weight to the conclusion that it was the Mameluke who spread the card deck. In 1377, a Dominican friar by the name of John of Rheinfelden wrote of the sudden appearance and invasion, as he called it, of cards in Switzerland and stated that they were like a revelation to him and that they could be used as a means to understand and explain the world, which is interesting and something that we'll come back to shortly. This rapid spread of playing cards again lends credence to the theory that it was the travelling soldiers and traders who distributed this handheld game craze, because the cards followed the exact route of the Mameluke. It makes sense though if you think about it, because cards are small enough to wrap in a piece of cloth and carry about without being a burden, much more comfortable than carrying a heavier box of dominoes with you, I would have thought. Historians believe travelling armies brought cards to England from France in about the 15th century, and from here, decks were then carried across the Atlantic by explorers, colonisers and invaders to America. There's also some evidence that cards were taken up and appealed to the indigenous and native Americans too, and quickly, in fact, from the earliest days of colonisation. The Native Americans apparently made cards on animal skins and devised their own suit symbols, such as feathers, acorns, coins and goblets. Why the cards were printed on skins rather than paper is unclear. Historians have theorised that either paper wasn't available or the skins the Native Americans used was more durable and survives the nomadic lifestyle of an Apache Indian better than a piece of paper would have done. I have to say though, I think most of us who are used to shuffling a deck made from cards would struggle to shuffle the leather deck. In Italy, the card designs mimics the Mameluke design. But in Germany, suits consisted of acorns or bells, hearts and leaves. So, what we can glean based on what we've said so far, and from what we do know from various surviving ancient decks, is that different cultures were keen to stamp their own identity onto the deck of cards. A bit like anything else, I suppose. It also demonstrates just how quickly the deck was absorbed into cultures. Clearly, it was at a staggering rate. The influence of different cultures and customs has also influenced the deck of cards in its representation of the sexes. Picture cards with kings and queens and jacks on are technically known as court cards. There are 12 court cards in a standard deck of cards. Every suit has three court cards. The court cards, or the picture cards, were inspired and called so based on those forming part of the royal courts or extended royal household. Court cards were in line with historic experience and attitudes in that the royal courts were obviously male-dominated, so it makes sense that the court cards were also originally depictions of males. The original Mameluke court cards depicted a king, a lieutenant and a second lieutenant. In Europe, the court's card the court cards consisted of a king and two marshals but no queens italian and spanish cards still only contain male court cards to this day in italy court cards consist of the fante which is the jack the cavallo which depicts a knight and the rey which is the king in spain again the sota is the jack the caballo the knight and the rey which is again the king it's actually the french card makers who are universally credited as being responsible for introducing a queen court card and despite my research i can't uncover what actually inspired this One article I read suggested that the explanation is that the French are courteous people and French gallantry has translated into the playing cards of the Queen. 
Who knows? But it's the only explanation I could find. So I'll leave that up to you to decide. In France, card makers also decided on a more inspired and radical innovation of the pack of cards. They decided to utilise only two colours for the deck's illustrations, red and black. This was quite literally a masterstroke, making the French deck recognisable, even with the glanciest of glances. As a result, the French design became the basis for the modern Anglo-American pack. The major suit systems we now know all became established at the end of the 15th century and haven't really been changed since. So, now we have an idea as to the early history of the deck of cards. Let's look at how they were used and viewed by society generally throughout the ages. Well, after spreading to most countries like wildfire, I think it's fair to say that by the end of the 14th century, cards were creating a stir all over and in Europe especially. Originally, apart from soldiers, it was only the nobility who indulged a love of cards, owing to the expense of the decks. However, once the spread of printing got underway, this created more accessibility to printed goods, and the man in the street could now afford his own pack of cards. It wasn't long, however, before the church and state felt compelled to intervene, as they feared that the popularity of the playing card would appeal way too much to the lower classes and morally corrupt them. In medieval European society, gambling was intrinsically linked to everyday life. Every game, every guess on whether a crop would fail or succeed, or whether someone would survive a plague, was based on wagering and gambling. Gambling was heavily frowned on, as it was seen as walking hand in hand with other reckless behaviours, such as heavy drinking and ultimately alcoholism, dishonesty, violence, crime generally, and the breakdown not only of family life, but also the wider community. Ultimately, and worst case scenario, in the authorities' eyes, the deck could undermine the church and its teachings. The World of Cards website has summed up the authorities' thoughts on playing cards quite nicely by stating that, and I quote, When playing cards arrived in Europe in the late 14th century, the church took a strict prejudicial view on what it saw as lewd, frivolous, fickle or dishonest behaviour. Members of the clergy would certainly not approve of playing cards if it had anything to do with gambling. Moralising tracts were published expressing disapproval of gambling as a mortal sin which might offend God and destroy lives, sometimes reaching fundamentalism. End quote. So, the scene was set and with this in mind, the church predictably soon began to issue strongly worded edicts, forbidding or restricting cards. In 1377 and in Paris, cards were forbidden to be played on workdays. In 1379, in St. Gall, Switzerland, games involving cards were banned. In 1382, in Lille, France, an ordinance forbade various games, including quartz, which was an early word for cards. And in the same year, and in Barcelona, Spain, several games, including cards, were prohibited. Laurenti Bocelli, writing in 16. 16- 09 in Decretia Ecclesiastica Gallicane said that at the Synod of Langre in 1404, Cardinal Louis de Bar, Bishop of Langre, forbade to the clergy from indulging in various games, including cards. In 1423, Saint Bernardino of Siena gave his famous and passionate sermon in which he stated that owing to the fact that Bologna appeared to be a rampant hotbed of gambling, that players should burn their cards. The story goes that when the inspired audience threw their cards into the fire, a card maker who was present and heard the denunciations, even against those persons who supplied the cards, cried, I have not learned, Father, any other business than of painting cards. And if you deprive me of that, you deprive me of life and my destitute family of the means of earning a subsistence. To this, the saint apparently replied, if you do not know what to paint, paint this figure and you will never have cause to repent having done so and showed the card maker a religious figure to paint. In 
In his 1457 Treatise of Theology, St. Anthony, Bishop of Florence, refers to and damns playing cards. The list goes on and the damning was, I think we can safely conclude, absolutely absolute. Meanwhile, in England and in the 15th century, authorities decided to really step it up. Parliament forbade the playing of cards, except for, curiously, during the 12 days of Christmas. In the 16th century, King Henry VIII complained that cards were distracting his bowmen. And in the 17th century, card makers, desperate to stop French imports and be able to cash in on the craze by making their own cards, appealed to the king, Charles I, to let them be exclusive makers of playing cards in this country. In 1628, the Worshipful Company of Makers of Playing Cards was granted their wish and charter to make and distribute cards by the king. But as they say, there's no such thing as a free lunch. In line with this theory, and indeed, in return for the granting of royal permission or charter to the company to make and distribute playing cards, Charles flexed his iron fist in order to control their sale. How did he do that, I hear say? Well, the authorities brought in that old chestnut that they always pull out when people are having too much fun. Yeah, that's right. You got it. Tax. Charles levied a tax on every deck made, which was the equivalent to about three pounds in today's money. As most taxes are, and in particular were during the medieval ages, this brainwave proved to be an excellent income for the crown. Duty continued to rise fast, and soon Charles had put it up to the equivalent of about £20 tax on every deck made. This was, and still is, an eye-watering amount of tax on a pack of playing cards, don't you think? To try and prevent tax evasion, the stamp for the Ace of Spades was held by Tax and Customs, and the Ace was only issued once the tax was paid. Well, as you can imagine, and as has been so since the beginning of time itself, there's always those who come up with a cunning plan to gain maximum profit and pay no tax. The penalty, however, if caught, was well swift and harsh. Again, nothing has changed there. In 1805, Richard Harding was sentenced to death for forging an ace of spades in order to sell cards without paying tax. This is perhaps why that particular card, the Ace of Spades, has often been associated with death and generally seen as unlucky. On this note, actually, there are several cards from the standard deck which have been regarded as unlucky and having negative connotations over the centuries. The Curse of Scotland is one such card and what the Nine of Diamonds is sometimes known by and is viewed by some apparently as being a very unlucky card to hold. There seems to be several tales as to how this card's got its name and reputation, but I think the one that seems to have some provenance is the historically correct fact that every ninth Scottish king was viewed to be a bit of a tyrant. Another card, the Four of Clubs, is sometimes referred to as the Devil's Bedstead or the Devil's Bedpost. Again, the origin of the Devil's Bedstead is difficult to trace. However, as best as I can tell, it comes from a novel written by Captain Frederick Shamier, a seafarer who wrote several books, including a naval story called The Saucy Arethusa, and which was published sometime around 1836. In that book, the captain retells a story which went like this. One Sunday afternoon, a group of men met secretly, as they often did, to play a game of cards. Back in the day, any recreational activity on a Sunday, especially gambling, was forbidden. But young men, being as young men are, they took no heed of this and played cards anyway. Just as the cards were dealt out, a stranger appeared and asked if he could join in. Dressed in fancy clothes he was, the young men agreed to let him play, all the while hoping the new card player would wager and lose large sums of money. 
When it was the stranger's turn to deal, he began shuffling the cards when he accidentally dropped the four of spades. He bent down to pick up the cards and one of the young men sitting next to him glanced down to where the card had fallen. To his horror, he saw the ebony edge of a cloven hoof. The young man jumped up and shouted to his friends that the stranger had a cloven hoof. With that, the young men realised that the stranger who had joined them in their game of cards was none other than the devil. Terrified, they fled the room, vowing never to go against the rules of the Sabbath. I'm not sure how true we can say this tale is, but what it does tell us is that even on the high seas, the sailors were aware that playing cards was forbidden by the church and playing cards on a Sunday, which was and is the Sabbath day, would be seen as pure devilment. There are similar stories connected to other playing cards, such as aces and eights, which are known amongst them apparently as dead man's hand. Black jacks are associated with poverty and unhappiness, and red jacks allegedly warn the player that they have an unknown enemy in their midst. Sailors and miners are said to view it as a definite no-no to take a deck of cards to work. Burglars are apparently wary of stealing decks from houses. And statistically, second-hand cards do not sell very well. It's said to bring bad luck to whoever plays cards on an uncovered table. And some go as far as to say that picking up a playing card with the left hand is evil. Really, there are so many tales connected with individual cards in a deck that I had to tear myself away from them. The list is endless. Who knew? Whatever the truth of these tales are, They illustrate that there is a long history here of superstition and morality and all told through a pack of cards. Anyway, it seems we've diverted slightly from our main discussion and so now back to our point about the excruciatingly high levels of tax levied on playing cards in England. Well, in other parts of Europe, the cost of cards were lower and so the uses of playing cards took quite a different turn. Originally, only the face side of a playing card was printed and therefore the back of a card could be used for anything such as a love letter, invitation or to share some other secret knowledge. In Vienna, poverty drove mothers to abandon their babies outside convents. They left messages on the backs of the cards to give their abandoned child an identity. The cards typically carried the name of the child and sometimes a heart-rending, desperately sad personal message regarding the circumstances behind the mother's decision to abandon her child. Common reasons included lack of food, illness or a child born out of wedlock. If cards were torn in half, this would be a sign that the mother would return with her matching half to reclaim her child and once circumstances permitted. If the card was whole, this was seen as a pretty definitive sign, if you like, that the mother would never return. Whatever their uses, it's fair to say that by the 18th century, so from the 1700s onwards, there is no doubting the popularity of the deck of cards. It's about this time that curiosity of history and meanings behind the cards started to grow. The idea of numerology combined with ancient secrets really came to the fore. The art of numerology is the idea that arcane and ancient and lost wisdom and knowledge can be found in numbers. A simple examination of a deck of cards will lead you to conclude that it's easy to see where the cards fit in here. There are 52 cards in a deck and 52 weeks of the year. As all the numbers up of a deck of cards and you get 365, which is the same number as the days of the year. There are 12 court cards in a deck and 12 months of the year. There are 13 cards in a suit and 13 lunar cycles. The colours of black and red are said by some to represent night and day. In the 19th century and 1800s, a Welsh publication told the story of the soldier's prayer book. The story goes that a soldier was in church and instead of a Bible, he pulled out a deck of cards, which the priest found highly offensive. The soldier was taken before the mayor of the city and tried for using cards in church. The publication states that a sergeant with a squad of soldiers attended church one Sunday. 
All of them that had Bibles pulled them out to find the text. But there was one of them that had no Bible, and he pulled out of his pocket a pack of cards. And while the minister was preaching, he kept first looking at one card and then another. The sergeant said to him, Richard, put up your cards for this is no place for them. Never mind that, said the soldier, for you had no business to bring me here. When the minister had ended his sermon, the sergeant arrested the man. Says the soldier, what have I done to cause my arrest? You have played a game of cards in the church. No, I have not, said the soldier, for I only looked at a pack. No matter for that, you must go before the mayor. When they came to the mayor's house, the mayor said, well, sergeant, what do you want? The sergeant replied, I've brought this soldier before your honour for playing cards in church. Soldier, what have you to say for yourself, asked the mayor. Much, I hope, replied the soldier. I have been five weeks upon the march and I am without either Bible, almanac or prayer book or anything but a pack of cards. But with them, I hope to satisfy your honour of the purity of my intentions. The story goes that the soldier pulled out of his pocket a pack of cards and spread them before the mayor. When I see the ace, said he, it reminds me that there is but one God. When I see the juice, it reminds me of the father and son. When I see the three, it reminds me of the father, son and the Holy Ghost. When I see the four, it reminds me of the four evangelists that preach the gospel, Mark, Matthew, Luke and John. When I see the five, it reminds me of the five wise virgins. They were ten, but five were foolish. When I see the six, it reminds me that in six days God made heaven and earth. When I see the seventh, it reminds me that on the seventh day God rested from all the works which he had created and made. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh and hallowed it. When I see the eighth, it reminds me of the eight righteous persons that were saved when God drowned the world. Noah, his wife, his three sons and their three wives. When I see the nine, it reminds me of the nine lepers that were cleansed by our Saviour. When I see the ten, it reminds me of the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai on two tables of stone. He then took the jack and laid it aside. When I see the queen, it reminds me of the Queen of Sheba, who came from the furthermost parts of the world to hear the wisdom of King Solomon, for she was as wise a woman as he was a man. She brought 50 boys and 50 girls, all clothed in boys' clothes, to show before King Solomon, for him to tell which were boys and which were girls. King Solomon called for water for them to wash themselves, and the girls washed up their elbows, and the boys only up to their wrists. So King Solomon told by that which were boys and which were girls. When I see the king, it reminds me of the great king of heaven and earth, which is God Almighty. Well, said the mayor, you have given a very good description of all the cards except one. The jack, said the mayor. Oh, I can give your honour a very good description of that if your honour will not be angry. No, I will not, said the mayor, if you will not term myself to be the jack. Well, said the soldier, the greatest jack that I know of is the sergeant that brought me here. I don't know, said the mayor, that he is the greatest jack, but I'm sure he's the greatest fool. I shall now show your honour how I use the cards as an almanac. You certainly are a clever fellow, said the mayor, but I think you will have a hard matter to make that appear. When I count how many spots there are in a pack of cards, I find that there are 365 and there are so many days in the year. Stop, said the mayor. That is a mistake. I grant it, said the soldier. But as I have never yet seen an almanac that is truly correct in all points, it would have been impossible for me to imitate an almanac without mistake. Your observations are very correct, said the mayor. Go on. When I count how many cards there are in a pack, I find that there are 52. There are so many weeks in a year. When I count how many tricks are in a pack of cards, I find that there are 12 and there are so many months in a year. You see, sir, that this pack of cards is a Bible, almanac, prayer book and pack of cards to me. 
the mayor was well pleased and called for refreshments for the soldier and then dismissed him saying he was the cleverest man that had ever been brought before him. The reference on this publication states that this account was taken directly from the clerk's office of the District Court of the United States for the Southern District of New York, which indicates that coming from an official court record, this was actually a true record of events. I find it intriguing that playing cards have been associated with soldiers from the days of the Mameluke to modern times, an unbroken connection through the centuries almost. They have not always just been witness to the long march or to amusing their owners through difficult conditions, however. Some have aided in achieving the impossible. During World War II, for example, Kolditz Castle in Saxony, Germany, was an impenetrable fort where the Germans placed their most high profile and prized prisoners of war. Being all heart, the German authorities allowed organisations, such as the Red Cross, for example, to deliver things like Christmas packages to the prisoners in the castle. Not wanting to waste this opportunity, the British and American Secret Services devised a cunning plan. As part of their Christmas packages, prisoners received a pack of playing cards. However, these were no ordinary cards. Once soaked in water, the cards would reveal a map of an escape route out of Kolditz Castle and also Saxony. At least 32 prisoners managed to escape the castle to freedom by using the maps. It's estimated that a further 300 prisoners in that region of Germany made attempted escapes based on the maps, which even had advice on which rivers to cross and roads to follow. Apparently, it wasn't until the 1970s that this amazing feat of human ingenuity came to light. And frankly, I don't know about you, but I'm still basking in its genius. Playing cards have also been used worldwide in a very practical sense and in various countries during times of conflict. For example, cards have been airdropped across communities by Allied forces to identify pictures of high-profile members of terrorist groups and despot leaders on the run, such as Saddam Hussein and Colonel Gaddafi. Such decks are now regarded as collector's items and can command thousands of pounds at auction. 52 pieces of history, all cut to size and stuffed in a cardboard box. It would seem, then, that imagery and playing cards walk hand in hand, and are almost intertwinable and inseparable, and many claims are made about the hidden imagery contained on playing cards. For starters, the court cards with their kings and queens are universally acknowledged to represent real historical figures. The King of Spades is said to represent King David, who was King of Israel before the time of Christ. This is the same David who slayed Goliath with a skillful throw of a single stone. The King of Hearts is said to represent King Charles, who was known as the father of Europe. The King of Diamonds is said to be Julius Caesar and so on. The King of Hearts is especially interesting. He is the only king without a moustache and appears, if you look at the card, to be stabbing himself in the head with a dagger. Historians have no clear explanation as to how the symbolism and the suicide king, as this card is known as, work alongside each other. So, Playing cards are symbolically charged objects for sure, I think we can say. Throughout history, the cards have provoked discord and discussion. However, there's one deck that has caused more debate and heated discussion than any other, and no other deck is surrounded by as much mystery and speculation as the one we're going to talk about next. What an introduction. And so, without further ado, enter the tarot. Tarot cards, I think it's fair to say, are traditionally seen as concerned with fortune telling and consisting of mystical symbolism. In fact, it's been claimed by some that the tarot deck, of which there are many variations, has extraordinary powers. The earliest surviving tarot deck dates from about the mid-1400s. The deck was made for the Visconti Storza, the wealthiest man in Milan at the time. They were hand-painted and very expensive. Historians believe tarot cards were created to expand on ordinary cards and were initially called triomphe or trumps. They beat the ordinary cards 
and this is why they were called tramps. Tramps were a set of 21 cards, each containing a symbol, and were added to an ordinary deck of 52 cards, which contained the court cards, so kings, queens, jacks and aces. An extra card was added to each suit, meaning that there were now 14 cards in each tarot suit instead of the 13 in a standard deck. A further picture card, known as the Fool, brought the number of cards in a standard tarot deck up to 78. The original idea behind the tarot, or trumps, as we have seen, was to add more cards to the deck and therefore allow more elaborate games to be played, so for example, bridge. Tarot spread as rapidly as the ordinary deck did, and if anything, boosted the popularity of cards within society to an even greater extent than had previously been seen. The intense speculation as to imagery and who may have harnessed their symbolism and indeed how to harness their power has followed the cards since their invention and has never really gone away. One of the most enduring stories involves Knights Templar. The Knights Templar were an elite band of knights formed in the 12th century and with the Crusades in mind. Their purpose, as we've said earlier, was initially to free the Holy Lands from Islamic rule and was sponsored by the church. However, it didn't take long after their inception for the rumour mill to really crank up. The rumours probably initially started because of the wealth the knights managed to gather. Soon it was rumoured that they had discovered the Holy Grail and other holy secrets and artefacts. It's therefore little surprised that it's alleged that the tarot carries Templar symbols. The head of Baphomet, for example, and a Templar cross are displayed on standard tarot cards. The Templars were accused of worshipping Baphomet, who was a mythical figure with a goat's head. When the knights were violently suppressed, some believe their secrets were preserved on tarot for future generations. These theories are dismissed by mainstream historians, as the Knights Templar were abolished prior to the invention of the tarot. I have to say, though, I don't find that a compelling argument to dismiss this theory. For example, Jesus had been crucified long before the publication of the Bible, and many things are written down after the event. Groups that are broken up do not always just die. Sometimes they become suppressed, go underground, and or morph into a different organisation. For example, there are a good deal of people who believe that the Knights Templar evolved into the Freemasons. The Freemasons have often been associated with code as a means of passing on to each other knowledge and wisdom. For example, it's suggested that a spring of acacia that can be seen in the Jack of Hearts hand. Acacia is an important Masonic association. Also, proposed roses held by the Queens are common to the Rosicrucians. And the four-armed king of hearts is said to depict the ancient Egyptian king, Armand. Again, if you're not sure who the Rosicrucians were, then have a listen to my episode of a couple of months ago, which is about the Georgia Guidestones, where, funnily enough, we reference the Rosicrucians there. Historians believe tarot imagery reflects the cultural fashion of the 15th century, when it was common for artists sculptures, architects and so on, to look back to classical times and mimic classical themes with their art. And that's what we call the Renaissance period. So, for example, in episode three, when we looked at Shugborough Hall and its cipher, we said that it was common for Greek temples to be built on the grounds of stately homes in this country. Owners of the estates, therefore, were mimicking the Renaissance craze that was sweeping southern Europe at the time, essentially. It was also common in 15th century Europe for everyday people to practice the occult practices as they would probably be described today. So, for example, alchemy, astrology and the Jewish Kabbalah, which is concerned partly with Jewish mysticism. The symbols contained on the tarot cards were fairly well known during medieval times, even to the ordinary person. We may find it strange to have a picture these days of a skeleton or devil within a gaming deck, But such symbolism would not have been usual at the time of the invention of the trump cards. The hanged man is, for example, a well-known Italian image. This trump card depicts a man hanging by his foot upside down. In medieval Italy, this was a well-known sign and was an indication of being a traitor to the state. 
In the late 18th century, scholars in France tried to read and understand the tarot. Jablon, who was a French mason, was heavily influenced by his fascination of ancient Egypt. He claimed that the knowledge contained on the tarot was rescued from a burning book from the Alexandra Library and came from the Book of Toth, the Book of Wisdom, which purportedly contained all knowledge. Jablon's idea was taken up by Eliphas Levi, who was a famous French poet and who wrote more than 20 books relating to magic, as well as Jewish mysticism and the Kabbalah. Levi claimed that the 22 tarot trumps related to the 22 letters of the Jewish alphabet and revealed the secrets of the Kabbalah. During the 19th century, tarot spread rapidly. In the UK, occultists designed their own decks. Arthur Edward Way is definitely the most well-known. He featured illustrations on all of the tarot cards. His deck is the most preeminent deck in the world. Alistair Crowley, his student, created his own special deck, which was described at the time as radical and revolutionary and redefining tarot. Crowley worked with painter Frida Harris, and the deck took five years to paint. The Crowley deck has a different mood from the weight deck, and it's frequently described as being brooding and mysterious. A cursory search online will reveal that there are literally thousands of differently themed tarot decks to suit the reader. The possibilities are literally endless. I remember at the age of 15, I, along with a friend, went to the market in Yorkshire where I grew up and approached a shop which sold incense sticks and crystals and that sort of thing. Myself and my friend attempted to purchase a tarot deck, not really knowing what we were going to do with them. I think we'd seen a film or something which had kind of inspired us. The lady behind the counter refused to sell us a deck, stating that they were not toys and not for kids to play with. As you can imagine, we were both stopped in our tracks that we were actually being refused and turned away and not being able to purchase the deck of cards. My teenage pride took a hit at the time, but to be honest, I've never really thought about it again until fairly recently when I looked again into what tarot cards are and the meaning behind them. A major block to many people entering any discussion related to tarot cards are the many Bible verses, for example, which prohibit divination and fortune telling. They are equivalent thoughts expressed in most holy books, so the Quran as well as the Torah. I could list the verses, but a simple internet search will reveal many and which you can easily find. However, the curious thing is that not everyone who uses tarot are aiming to tell fortunes or conjure connection with the other side, as it were. There appears to be a growing trend of people finding other uses for this controversial deck. I wasn't really surprised, therefore, to discover that the number of people purchasing tarot decks and displaying an interest in them has never been higher. In December 2021, the Washington Post published an article on this very phenomenon, stating that tarot cards are having a moment with thanks to the pandemic. The article then goes on to state how sales of decks have more than doubled over the past five years and that, quote, tarot has no singular owner or perspective on how to use it and its modern iterations are diverse. Some people use it in psychotherapy, life coaching and yoga studios. For many, tarot are used as a tool for self-care, end quote. The modern use of tarot therefore seems to be more about meditation and self-reflection maybe. Use of the cards is about archetype and image reading, which means that archetypal images are used to understand truths from our own subconscious minds. The reader of the cards focuses on the details in the cards and relates them to their own life. In a type of meditation, and as the Washington Post said, as part of a self-care routine, Try looking up the word cartomacy and you'll see that there are those who use the standard 52 card deck to achieve the very same outcomes of divination or self-care. In some cultures, there are those who use bones, shells, grains of sand and anything and everything in between as opposed to playing cards or the tarot deck. The tools, I would say, whatever they are, merely provide a point of focus for the reader to concentrate on. Whether that's for 10 seconds or 10 minutes, the aim is the same, a meditative act. So, we've had a look 
at the history of the deck. We've looked at some of its uses. And so the final question, what does the deck of cards mean today and where does it fit within our society? Well, based on what we've said so far, our attitude towards any deck of cards is actually a reflection of human society as it's transpired over the ages. There are many ways our relationship as a people with the deck can tell a story. The story is both simple and complicated. Maybe that's the appeal of the playing card. Small, transportable, colourful. People love a secret. Only you know your own hand. The endurance of the cards is therefore timeless. Behind the mysticism of the cards is the fact that many records which could explain their symbolism and history are like so much other swathes of ancient know-how lost to time. So in our final analysis, how do you decode or define the cards? Well, the answer is simple. The card deck, whether standard or the extended tarot, can be a game, a trick, or a key to your own spirituality. It can also be a modern day way of disseminating information during times of conflict. It can be whatever you want it to be, and it has been that way since at least 850 AD. Sales of hard copy books, newspapers, and other physical items dwindle, yet the playing card goes from strength to strength. All that's left is that the cards are part of human culture and history, just as much as we are a part of the cards, culture and history. So, next time you reach for that deck of cards, maybe you'll pay a little more attention to that little box stuffed full of 52 little pieces of our past, present and future. A little longer staring at the imagery contained on them. And a little longer appreciating that every time you shuffle that deck, you're creating endless possibilities of the hand you deal or the hands that you are dealt. The power and your story is quite literally in your hands. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, I'd very much appreciate it if you could leave me some stars or even better, a written review on whichever platform you listen to your podcasts on. So from me, your host, Jazz O'Brien, thank you for tuning in. And please feel free to reach out with any comments, feedback, suggestions for topics for future episodes or anything at all you'd like to share. As always, if you'd like to reach out and join the conversation, then please email me on jazz at the or drop me a WhatsApp message or voice note on 07506 704 705. Alternatively, head over to the chattery.com and you can get all the contact details on the Chattery website. The Chattery, the definitive compendium of conversation, insight and intrigue since 2022. Thank you so much, guys and girls, for listening to The Chatter with Jazz O'Brien. Follow us on thechattery.com and never miss an episode. Join the conversation by dropping us a WhatsApp message, question, or voice note, or email jazz at thechattery.com. Till next time.